Ken Jennings and Richard Garfield. Welcome to the Game Informer Show, guys. Thanks for having us. Hi, good to be here. Oh my God, it's an honor to have you. Okay, you guys have teamed up uh, for a new board game called Half Truth? Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was reading Ken's book, Brainiac, and I was blown away with his uh, uh, love of trivia, and he really uh, conveyed to me that trivia was a, an art form which I hadn't appreciated and that it was much more egalitarian than I had thought. It was uh, much less about uh, a black and white knowledge of what you know or don't know and more uh, often uh, deduction and intuition and all sorts of wonderful things. And so I wanted to make a game which really brought that out. And uh, a couple of years later, I had such a framework and contacted Ken and uh, here we are. So you kind of came up with the game rules, and then Ken, you're bringing the, the trivia expertise here. Is that how it works? That's right. I, a couple of years later, I got an email from Richard saying, hi, I'm Richard Garfield. And I already thought it was a prank at that point. You know? <laughs> and then he said, I, liked your, I read and liked your book, which seemed even more unlikely. And then he said, how about doing a trivia game with me? Uh, so you know, once I found out it was real, it was the most delightful email I'd ever received. And, uh, and yeah, we kind of consulted on that basis, his his game design smarts and my trivia uh, resume. Okay, so the trivia resume, does that mean that you're just now sitting in a white room uh, listing as many trivia questions as you can? Or what do you, what do you bring to the table here, Ken? <laughs> I'm just sitting on the toilet reading the almanac like I usually do. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, honestly, like from the trivia people I've met, like I've kind of been surprised that they are not Rain Man style savants. They're just kind of normal people who are very curious about everything and as a result they they pay attention and you know i have an aesthetic of trivia that i came up watching a lot of jeopardy and i really like jeopardy style trivia trivia that's designed to be answered correctly and has a lot of little hints and little puzzles to solve more like a little riddle than a you know can you name the number of elevators in the empire state building kind of trivia yeah and and on that basis i you know when i saw rich design i was like this is great this is a trivia game that'll actually make people feel smart and not that feeling we often get at trivial pursuit of just feeling dumb all evening <laughs> so what's the secret how do you make somebody constantly feel smart while playing trivia uh well the there was a couple things I wanted to see. Uh, the first was that everybody participates in every question. Uh, there's no uh, worse frustration for me than a, an evening of trivia where uh, everything's going poorly and then finally there's something going on that my genius uh, company doesn't know and I'm not asked that question. So everybody had to ask, uh, participate in every question so that uh, if there's something you know, you get a chance to show it off. Um, the second thing is that, uh, that you've got some sort of hook into it to begin thinking about it. And so for that purpose, I went to multiple choice answers and, uh, or multiple choice questions. And uh, uh, I began out with uh, six answers. One of them is correct, uh, but quickly moved to a much more interesting uh, six answers. Three are correct, three are incorrect. Huh. And that way, uh, if you can deduce uh, anything, uh, uh, you've got any intuitions, you, you can uh, cross any of them off your list, you're improving your chances. And you get the lion's share of the reward for just getting one of them right. You can get bonus points for getting two or three right, uh, but but uh, uh, the the payoff is small relative, possibly to the risk because you wouldn't make any progress during that turn. And you think that's the biggest hook for the overall game is the idea that uh, you can get one right, but you can also go for the the full money here. Yeah, uh, it, it gives you a strategic, uh, an interesting press your luck strategic uh, option also because uh, because any any given question you're wondering. Uh, whether you should uh, take a chance and throw in an extra answer or two. Yeah, I think I think for a trivia guru type, you'll have a little edge. You know, if you actually, you know, you're mathematically, you're going to know more of the answers. But the beautiful thing is that because each card has three right answers and three wrong answers, you know, everybody's got a everybody's got a chance. Um, the first time I played with Richard, uh, I won the first game and I felt, you know, very good about myself. That's as things should be. Uh, <laughs> But then we ran it back and I got beat. Wow. And I realized, you know, this is a game where, um, you know, everybody can kind of feel like an expert about something. Everybody can feel like they're never out of their league. Uh, everybody can feel smart. Yeah, for sure. So what need do you feel like this game is fulfilling out there, Ken? Like there's other trivia tabletop games that are really popular, like Wits and Wagers, stuff like that. What is the, what is the hook that this one has, do you think, that separates it from the pack? 
Richard and I like uh, many of those games. Um, if there's a hook, I think it's the accessibility of it. This is a party game that doesn't kill the party um, because, you know, the answers are right there and you're just trying to outwit, you know, me and Richard. You know, you're trying to figure out what are the three lies on this card. Uh, uh, and I guess the other uh, the other hook is just the um, it's the quality of the of the trivia. You know, that's. You know, I, I see it as an art. You know, trivia is kind of my church, and I take it very seriously. <laughs> it's my religion. And, uh, and and I think the questions in this game are smart. They're fun. They're the kind of thing that's uh, so fun that you'll you'll enjoy them even if you don't get them right because there's going to be something surprising or clever. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what have you learned from working with Richard? Uh, Richard, just don't listen for a little bit. But what's been the most satisfying hey. or interesting part? <laughs> uh, really, the, I guess... Uh, I'm a very casual tabletop game fan. Like I really enjoy it when I do it with friends, but it's not a, you know, it's, it's not a a huge part of my life. And so I I never really thought about all the design decisions that go into making a smart, fun game, you know, like the long conversations we have about whether a token is going to be slightly bigger or slightly thicker or, uh, you know, whether this should be a two, a two space penalty or a three space penalty or, should the board fold or not? You know, these are long involved conversations that really are going to pay off for the for the player. And I had never thought about like, I, I appreciate my games 100 times more now. Yeah. Did, was there a part of you that thought like, oh, trivia board game, this will be easy to design. And then it's just, oh, now you're bogged down in cardboard quality discussions. Yeah. <laughs> no, like I, I, I'm really interested in all this, you know, like the thing about being a trivia nerd is you you are curious about everything. And I like everything I've found out of uh, game design is fascinates me. Yeah. Do you play many video games, Ken? Do you have a favorite video game of all time? Favorite video game? Like, I'm definitely somebody who gets so addictive about video game that it starts to ruin my life. Like, you can see, like, if you graph my college GPA, you can see when Mario Kart 64 came out. (laughs) There's a a real trough there. The last thing I really got obsessed with was The Witness a couple years ago. And then my family didn't see me for like a month while I played The Witness. Oh, wow. How did that one get on your radar? Uh, you know, I rem- uh, so many friends recommending it. Uh, it's really, really on brand for me, as you know, if you've played the game. Yeah. And it reminded me of like playing Myst as a kid. Um, and uh, not just the puzzle solving aspect, but just kind of the immersive world that that game creates. Do you feel like uh, your your super genius mind was able to tackle the witness of challenges faster than most? Or was it about uh, average compared to the average gamer, you think? There were, like, I feel like spatial stuff is not really my thing. So there were plenty of puzzles in The Witness where I thought, like, I, I'm going to spend weeks on this and I don't know if I'm ever going to get it. And sometimes I would spend weeks on it. And, you know, it just turned out to be dumb luck in the end. Um, <laughs> I am not a Jeopardy level. I'm not at the same level player I am at The Witness as I am on Jeopardy. Right. Have you ever yeah. done video game uh, categories in Jeopardy? Has that ever come up? Video games come up on Jeopardy from time to time. I'm trying to think if I ever got one right. I don't know. <laughs> I'm the, like I'm a dad now. Like I'm the kind of guy that says Pokemons Ooh. instead of Pokemon just <laughs> oh, with my son. Right. You're so, smarter than that, man. Come on. That's good. Not really my field. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, do you have a favorite video game of all time? Uh, it's 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 really hard for me to pick favorite games. I can list a few I'm uh, I'm I'm playing. Uh, I, I, I uh, am currently returned to Overwatch, which I quit for a long time. Oh wow! Uh, but uh, I used to love TF2 and uh, and uh, have liked uh, Overwatch from time to time. Uh, I uh, have liked the uh, auto chess uh, category that's real. This just opened up on uh, on the Dota variants and now uh, the League of Legends. Uh, uh, in, in the past, I've I've really liked. Uh, uh, there's a, a small game called Quadradius that I thought was brilliant, uh, and uh, always wished had gotten more uh, traction. I think it's still playable uh, on on a browser, but uh, but uh, certainly is is a. Uh, uh, doesn't have a huge community. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I love that you're into auto chess. I don't think I would have expected that, but you appreciate it just on a game design level. Oh, auto chess is yeah. It's very very orthogonal to stuff that's been done. Uh, it, it struck me in a similar way to uh, d- that Dota did, where when Dota came out, it was uh, like it was very very different than the stuff had come previously, and I was uh, uh, really thought it had some great uh, design concepts in it. And this is the same thing. Auto chess sort of breaks a lot of those rules. And it's like this combination of, a, of, a, I don't know, a, a tower defense and a rummy game or something. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely bizarre. Uh, Ken, uh, you have 
been brought up in a game former video in the past. We did like this, we did these rapid fire video interviews with game developers, and we did one with uh, the creative director for Mortal Kombat who had Ronda Rousey in the game. And in that rapid fire interview, I had to cite uh, your greatest tweet, unquestionably of all time, which is where you just said, Ronda Rousey, Scooby Doo. As in, Scooby Doo said Ronda Rousey, and it is impossible to get that out of my brain. So thank you for breaking my brain with that stupid joke. <laughs> Wait, did you actually tell Ronda Rousey that tweet? Not, not Ronda Rousey, but because she was in the game, the creative director, uh, and he was, he wasn't as impressed. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if that's my best tweet, but I do think it's funny if Scooby Doo were to say Ronda Rousey. <laughs> uh, Ken, well, okay, trivia in general. Some people listening, probably a fair amount listening, will occasionally do some bar trivia stuff like this, and I'm sure you get this question all the time. But do you have any just basic advice for going into to simple pub trivia and and best way to tackle that uh yeah if you're me wear a disguise uh, that, <laughs> all right that's my main tip uh like the thing to remember is that uh these questions are written generally in hopes that you will get them right you know the, the question is not your enemy the question writer is your opponent right so this question did not come down from outside you're trying to somebody wrote this like there's a creator there's a human writer and you're if you can get inside their head you can beat the question. So I think too often people will just throw up their hands and be like, oh, this looks like it's about uh, disco music. I don't know anything about disco music. Or this looks like it's about European history. I, I'm not interested in history. But that's not what's happening there. There's like a match going on, a game of wits between you and, you know, what the nerd who wrote the question. And at a certain and, point, oh, go ahead. No, what's your question? Oh, I was just going to say, at a certain point, like, you know, I've been playing a lot of uh, bar trivia recently, and it's like, this guy has had like, five questions about pretty in pink you know and it's like okay i think i can figure out the age of this dude and so if i just look at pop culture when that guy was like graduating high school i'm probably gonna be better off throughout the rest of these games that actually happened in half truth like i was very wary of writing all the questions myself because i knew like it would just have my biases like if i'm more into uh, uh, you know, 70s rock than I am into MMA. There's going to yeah. be too much 70s rock and not enough MMA. So, you know, we, we had a we had a team of people write the questions and, and I edited them. And as a result, it was much more diverse. I think I think I still ended up writing about half the game. So if you see a few too many um, like Marvel Comics questions, that's on me. <laughs> <laughs> How do you guys find the people that actually write the questions? A lot uh, of Richard, right? Uh, it, it began out, it certainly began out with me and then uh, uh, my game group, uh, in, my wife made some, uh, started making some uh, excellent questions and uh, 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 Scaff Elias, who works with me at Th uh, Three Donkeys did. And uh, and so it was, it began out being uh, gamers writing the questions uh, and then uh, when we got Ken involved, uh, uh and he, he began providing uh, questions and also guidance to us as to which of the questions we made really worked well and which ones needed, uh, needed some changes. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, Ken, I know we have to let you go early. Is there anything else you want to say about Half-Truth here? Uh, um, I mean, you may never get to play me on Jeopardy, but you can try to, like, you can try to outsmart me on every card in the Half-Truth deck. If you... <laughs> if you, if you, if you, if you you pick out one of those answers that's right and get to move your token, you can say you beat Ken Jennings. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> and the game is on Kickstarter right now? Yeah, it's it starts on Kickstarter this week. It's a 30-day campaign. And we're really excited about this. Neither Richard nor I have ever done a Kickstarter project, a Kickstarter game. And we're really excited by the chance to like build a community around the game like before there's even a game, you know? Yeah. Like, Find out what people find out what angles people are interested in. Find out which questions they like. Like that can guide future expansions of the game. You know, just the idea that the power of like fan enthusiasm could be more powerful than other forms of consumerism is, is like very like comforting to me. And I and I'm I'm excited to try it out on this game. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey Ken, thank you for your time, man. We'll we'll let you run off here and then focus solely on Richard. Okay. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having. Me. All right, take care, man. We're not done yet, though, Richard. We got a lot of questions okay. for you, man. It seems like you're a bit, you've been incredibly prolific lately. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, how do you think like Richard Garfield? What, what's your secret? Are you just taking a lot of notes? Do you feel like you're ramping up at this stage in your career for some reason? Uh, no, I think I'm plodding along at the same rate I always have. Uh, I, I'm just fascinated by games and uh, am cross-pollinating everything I know. So uh, 
So uh, as I gather more knowledge about games, uh, uh, there's probably more connections there to be made. But, uh, for example, uh, uh, Half-Truth was created like eight years ago, right? And, uh, um, and uh, another uh, big game that I've done recently, Keyforge, uh, the concept of it was laid out 20 years ago, and it's taken this long for the uh, printing science to be able to catch up to the concept. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, I've got a closet filled with uh, half-made and failed games, and I go into it, grab things, and continue trying to work on them or bring pieces of them into other games. I love that idea. I mean, most people have a notebook or notes in their phone or something, and I love the idea that you have physical thoughts manifested that are just sitting in your closet and you can just rummage through and be like, what if I combine this with this? It, it works very much like that. I, I, I go in there and uh, open up a box and, and I'm trying to figure out this, this, this concept did not make it far enough for me to actually write the rules down, but I've got enough of the components I can kind of remember what I was trying to do and uh, begin work from there. Yeah. Do you have any advice for uh, people out there that might be trying to design their own tabletop game? Uh, uh, yeah, I probably got a bunch of advice. My, my most, uh, uh, commonly given advice though, is to, uh, play games outside your comfort zone and try to learn what makes them fun to their audience. Uh, and if you do that, you can often incorporate those things that are attractive to that audience into your games without necessarily making your game into that, uh, that other game. Uh, the more you know, the more tools you have. Yeah. Do you have, uh, do you have an example from your own career where you feel like that really that lesson paid off, or when it really clicked for you? Uh, well, well, sure. Um, uh, Half truth is absolutely one, and the reason for that is because when I read this book, uh, Brainiac, um, I realized that although I had been giving this advice for years, I actually hadn't applied it to myself in trivia games. And I had sort of not given much thought to trivia games, which was a genre I occasionally enjoyed, but, uh, but didn't really think there was much to. And uh, this book made me step back and say, hey, wait a minute, what's going on here that, that people really love? And I was able to look at my experiences and, uh, and, and connect some dots and realize that there was something there I really did like. For example, uh, I remembered playing trivia with my grandmother, and there maybe would be a dozen people in the room, and she was not like a star player, but it was pretty amazing because these you know, every, every 10, 15 minutes, something would come up that she was the only person with a clue about, and, uh, and that was kind of cool. Yeah, and so that's always in your mind, is you want this game to be played by families? Yeah, Absolutely. If a game can't be played with grandparents, it's no good in your mind. <laughs> yeah. What What about um? Do video game companies reach out to you a fair amount, asking you to consult, uh, to work on this project, that project? Like, how has your relationship with the video game industry kind of evolved over time? Uh, I do get a a approached to consult on on uh, on different games and and. Uh, um, sometimes if I'm very interested in a game, I'll go talk to them and, and, uh, 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 and see what they're thinking about and whether I can help out with that. Yeah. No, it's interesting. So like with team fortress, like you just became a fan. That's when you reached out to valve. Was that that type of relationship? Um, yes. Uh, well, I was a, a, a I was a fan of team fortress, uh, before valve even got in, uh, involved with it. Uh, but then when, uh, I learned that they were, uh, making TF2, uh, and, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, Chris Green, who was, uh, uh, somebody who worked on some of the original magic software, uh, was involved, uh, and he's a, a, a pal of mine, uh, uh, I, I really began to be interested in what they were doing. And there's actually an interesting story there with that game in particular, uh, which illustrates my relationship with uh, 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 some of these games, which is that uh, uh, I wrote a, uh, an article in, um, I think, the Game Developer magazine um, on uh, Luckin Games. And Chris Green and his team read that article, and I was basically saying that uh, Luck was getting uh, a, 
a, a bad had sort of a bad reputation among a, a lot of developers and designers, but it was a really useful for tool for making it so that the game was uh, broadly playable. And uh, and there were some other things there, but that was the gist of it. But uh, but uh, uh, after that, they introduced a critical hit system into TF2, uh, uh, the playtest, the uh, beta, I suppose. And uh, and they didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, um, and they got lots of positive feedback, like they don't know what was going on, but the game was a lot more fun, that sort of thing. Huh. And so then when they told people, there was a lot of people who were like, uh, complained about it and, uh, you know, it's too swingy and so forth. But they were already convinced because this uh, this uh, concept had been sort of tested blind. And, uh, and the extra luck in the game, uh, when people didn't know to blame their failures on luck, they were actually having a lot more fun. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, what surprised you about the reception towards Artifact when that game launched? Uh, well, I think uh, I'm really happy with Artifact as a game. Uh, obviously, its launch left a lot to be desired. Um, and I think that the uh, big issues with it were community relationship issues. Uh, and uh, um, I, I, I can't say it surprised me uh, uh, because... I don't know because because I'm skeptical these days, and uh, uh, and I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, emotions that run high with uh, the concepts of free play and how you revenue model things and uh, and uh, what you know how much luck is in a game and so forth. Uh, but uh, but uh, I do wish we could have uh, uh, figured out a way to manage uh, our relationship with the uh, with the fans better because. Uh, because in the end, I think that uh, the game was a very, very good game, but uh, not necessarily for everybody. And those people who it was for often didn't get a chance to see it because uh, of the negative noise surrounded by the people who uh, perhaps wanted Half-Life 3 or right. wanted, a, uh, you know, wanted Hearthstone or you know, something else. So in retrospect, would you have pushed harder to make it free to play then, or what do you think is the solution? Um, certainly, uh, uh, that I, I would have been, I would consider that uh, the. Uh, uh, I think a lot of what I was, what we were trying to do was avoid some of the uh, negative stuff with the free to play uh, games, uh, because one of the things I I. I don't like a lot about a lot of free-to-play games is that they end up having this relationship with the content and grinding uh, and people who buy uh, are often looked down because they're sort of cheating uh, and I uh, don't want a relationship with uh, the games I make uh, I don't want that the relationship with the games I make and people being that they have to do grinding in order to get the content they should want the content uh, but that doesn't mean that there's no avenue for free play. We talked, for example, uh, early on about making it so, for example, all the free cards, all the uh, common cards were free. Uh, and that might be an avenue because in all my games, I usually make it, I make it so that the common cards are very strong and you can get by on just the common cards. And uh, you may not uh, be able to win as often as, as having the full variety, but, uh, but you, can, you, know, you can hang with uh, people with much bigger collections. Yeah, for sure. Did you start to plan an expansion for Artifact before you left, or was that never in the in the cards for you? Oh, uh, th there were expansions being worked on before uh, before I left. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so in general, I mean, would you say there's hard feelings at this point, or is it just an interesting experiment that didn't quite launch the way you expected? Uh, there's no hard feelings uh, between me and Valve. I think they're uh, I think they're uh, smart. Uh, and uh, they paid attention to what uh, what we talked about uh, in development, and uh, and I think we worked together and made a great product. Um, uh, and I, I don't believe there's any hard fe feelings the other way, but uh, there were high emotions, and so the, sometimes those get uh, those get mixed up. Um, the uh, um, I, I because the underlying game. I have faith in, and I am contacted uh, uh, on a not in common, uncommon basis by people who are experts at games, uh, like uh, ex-Magic 
pro tour players, that sort of thing, who really like uh, Artifact, uh, I have this uh, sort of idealistic hope that it'll find its audience eventually. Uh, 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 but uh, but I also know that there's a lot of uh, uh, games I love that never did succeed, and uh, and so and so that may not be the case. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Um... I'd imagine you working with Valve and working so much with Gabe, I'd imagine it's a really interesting dynamic where you're both learning from each other. Can you think of anything that you really learned from Gabe that you didn't know before, like a big takeaway of like, oh, it's a really smart perspective on this or this? Uh, uh, well, I did not work uh, with Gabe uh, directly uh, much. I mostly worked with the teams and I, so I believe I, I learned some things indirectly through him because I think his uh, his uh, uh, intelligence and uh, and and uh, uh, the structure he uh, has wanted is is there and uh, and is reflective of uh, what he was after. And I, I, I was uh, um, and and as far as the team goes, uh, I, I was uh, very interested at how open they were to uh, critique from all directions and how they would try things out and be open to uh, 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 alternate solutions and so forth and how relentlessly focused on uh, the player quality uh, they were. Now, you won't, they themselves won't advertise that because uh, because they've got a very hands-off uh, relationship with marketing and so forth they don't I, I don't believe they believe in marketing themselves and I believe that actually could have helped uh, a game like artifact but uh, but people on the outside would be saying oh they're just trying to grab pennies or you know they're making this decision because it's going to make them more money or something like that I can say that consciously was never part of their dealings with each other they were always uh, focused on what's going to be the best experience for the play players. They may have made mistakes along those lines, but that was where they were coming from, and I think that comes from Gabe, and I was really surprised to, to see uh, how uh, how strongly they followed it. Yeah. Well, it's bizarre now. I'd imagine, I know some people from the Artifact team have moved on to work on Dota Underlords, and it's interesting with you loving auto chess, would you ever think of reconnecting and uh, <laughs> helping out with Dota Underlords in any way? Would you have any advice for them? Oh, I, I, I certainly would connect it. Uh, my, you know, I'm really uh, busy these days with uh, with uh, uh, KeyForge and some other things. But uh, in the future, I, I certainly would be open to it. I think they they probably uh, need need some more time uh, distant from uh, uh, distant from from me and uh, and uh, and my point of view because because uh we, we you know as i said emotions and uh we invested a lot of energy and uh in uh in artifact and uh that was all sort of sort of tied together in uh in a uh in, in a lot of uh stress uh but uh but in time uh that might happen and uh and and certainly uh, uh i you know it's like a while uh I, I really like Artifact and what we were trying to do there is like uh, I, I love games and love it when new things are done and and boy uh, uh, the auto chess uh, genre has something new and uh, and uh, I'm really excited by that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any thoughts on uh, Magic the Gathering video games? Whether or not you'd like to see more of them moving into the future? Uh. uh well, it's it's always great to see when uh, your work uh, it grows in a new place. So, in that sense, I would like to see more, uh, um, and I'd like to see it uh, 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 grow from the uh, uh, the roots that it has, which is uh, this sort of uh, strategic, massively modular. Uh, game where you can really customize your strategy and uh and personalize it uh, so uh I, I i don't feel like there needs to be more but every time i see another that presses that uh, i get excited and uh, and it's it's gratifying yeah absolutely well hey i've kept you here for a long time but uh, congratulations on the launch of half truth's kickstarter um i'm looking forward to playing it i love trivia games i definitely will give it a try uh anything else you want to say about half truth in general uh no i think i've i've, I've said it all it's been uh it's been marvelous uh, working with Ken. Uh, he's uh, one analogy to our relationship uh, you, is that uh, 
I'm, I'm kind of the hardware designer. I've designed the framework of the game, and uh, um, he's uh, the programmer. He uh, he uh, was the you know edited all the questions, and uh, and so in a lot of ways he was like the uh, software engineer for it. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Well, hey, Richard Garfield, thank you so much for your time, man. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for the interest. Absolutely. And thanks so much for watching or listening to this episode of the Game Informer Show podcast. Be sure to tune in next Thursday. We'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. That was just a clip from a larger show called the Game Informer Show. You can find it on iTunes, Google Play, or GameInformer.com. We take the fun opportunities and exclusive information from Game Informer magazine and boil it into a show that airs every Thursday with exclusive cover story information, developer interviews, a lot of fun stuff. So come love games with us.